all electronic devices, that we should have proper dignity and decorum during the course of the service. Uh, my name is Rabbi Benjamin Blau. I have the privilege of serving as the rabbi of Green Road Synagogue, where Hetty was a longtime member. Although, in truth, I'm here today really because I had the pleasure of her friendship. For, uh, as for the last five to seven years, every Thursday, we spent time together, and I grew to really appreciate her and will miss her terribly. We're going to start off with a parak of Tillam, a chapter of, from Psalms. I'll do parak of Gimel, the 23rd chapter. I'll read it in Hebrew and then translate it into English. Mizmar le David, Adonai roi lo exor, binos desha yabitseni am emenukos yin aleini, nafshi yishovev, yan keni bimagle tzedek liman shimo, gam ki elech begates al maves lo iwara ki ato imodi, shiftacho mishan techo heima yinach amuni, tarok lefonai shoko neget so riroi, di shant of a shemen roshi kosi rivoyo, achtovo chesed yudafuni ko yamechayai, a song of David, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not lack. God makes me lie down in hot lush pastures. God leads me beside tranquil waters. God restores my soul and guides me in righteous path for God's name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your scepter and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in full view of my adversaries. You have anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. May only goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for length of days. We have gathered today to pay our tribute to a loving mother, Bubby, great-grandmother, a tireless member of our community, Tzedi Small, Chaya, Vasvi Hirsch. I'm going to really just say a few words. Her family who she was unbelievably close with and incredibly connected to, is going to deliver the main eulogies, just share a little bit of thoughts and perspective, but to turning it over to the family. To say that she was a survivor only tells part of the story. It's true, she was a survivor. She overcame the horrors of the Holocaust. She came to this country and she and her beloved husband, Joseph, they had nothing. They were penniless. They didn't have an education. They didn't know the language, although she spoke many languages very well. And nonetheless, she survived. She was incredibly strong, and she persevered, and she connected to her faith the entire time, which is simply incredible. But more than a survivor, I would have called her a builder. She was a builder of an amazing family, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And she was unbelievably loving and accepting of all of them. And that's how she built this family. She had love for all of them. You'll hear from the family members, her incredible dedication, how much food she cooked. I know there are many people here who are paying their respects, who grew up with the various children. And I think you ate many meals there as well. But she loved them unconditionally. She wanted them to continue her legacy. And they did. It's incredible. If you talk to the members of the family, you talk to her daughters-in-law and son-in-law, and they talk of her like a parent. The love that she had for them and the love that they had in return was complete. She was always talking about the past. When I'd visit her, we'd often reminisce about her upbringing, about her home, but her focus was on her children. You went to visit her room and you saw all the pictures, and she was excited. She was always excited, and she was incredibly excited when they came to visit. It was an unbelievable bond. I do want to mention, and I, he may be upset with me, but I, I'll say it anyway. All of the members of the family were wonderful to her, but Steve was in another, another, another level. I have told him many times, I hope I am as good a child to my parents as he is, as he w is and was to his parents. Not a day went by that he did not visit them. Not a day. If he was in the country, <laughs> he visited them. And she loved it. She loved all when all her grandchildren came to visit. It lit up her eyes. This was what meant so much to her. The last few weeks when I would visit her, she'd often talk about we going home. And I think she meant two things. On the one end, I think she met her home in Greenlawn, her home here in Beechwa, the home that their family had gathered together, all the family, for so many times. 
for so many joyous occasions. And I think she was also talking about her home back in Europe, the Heim, the home that she came from. She talked often about her parents. She talked about her siblings. She's now returned to both. I will miss her. I had such a good time going to see her each week. I see her caretakers here with her, and we enjoyed those lunch together. She always wanted to know if I had eaten. <laughs> I actually had to come late, because if I came during her meal, she talked to me and she wouldn't eat. So I started coming a little later, not to interfere. But it was my privilege to get to know her. It was my privilege to consider her my friend, not just my congregant. Yehi zikra baruch, may her memory be a blessing. She's going to live on. Her glorious legacy of 97 years will live on through her children, grandchildren, great children, all doors, all generations that will come, I know will continue her legacy. She made, though a, a woman of slight stature, she was a giant. May her memory be a blessing. We're going to call up four speakers from the family. First, two of her children, Marion and Steve, and then two of her grandchildren, Danny and Elliot, to say a few words. Small, my mother, was born Heinel Kostur, September 19, 1922, in Ungvar, Czechoslovakia, which is now the Ukraine. She had three brothers, one older and two younger. Her mother and her family left home for the ghetto. Sunday evening before Shavuos, May 14th, 1944, her parents, her three brothers, her grandparents, her aunts, they were in the second or third transport, which you may have read about in books or seen in the movies, but it was very real to them. They traveled for three days in the transport arriving May 17, 1944, taken to Auschwitz. I'll never forget, and my mother told me she was standing next to her mother, and her mother was holding her younger brother's hand. He was 10 years old. In front of her eyes, they were taken one direction to the gas chamber, and she was put in the line to, quote, live in Auschwitz. Her mother was 45 years old. Her younger brother, Mick Sestern, was 10. Her brother, Jano, which is what we called him, and that was his Hungarian name, English name, Eugene, he survived and he was in the Russian army. Her older brother also survived and then went to Russia. Her father lived in Auschwitz for a while, but I know she told me he got sick and was unable to survive and died there. My mother was there in Auschwitz for over a year. A good friend of hers, from 1944-1945 in Auschwitz was here in Stone Gardens. And this friend of hers, I met her several times. She would come to my parents' house for happy occasions. She came to my wedding. I found her at Stone Gardens. And when I went to see her, big smile on her face, so happy to see me, first thing she did was offer me her breakfast. They always offered someone else first. But she told me a story 
that while in Auschwitz, Auschwitz, it was my mother who kept her alive. My mother remained in Auschwitz, and she was liberated May 8, 1945. After the war, those who survived somehow found their way home. Did they take a bus? Did they take a train? They went back home to their cities. She met my father in Yablonets, Czechoslovakia Republic. They got married May 16, 1946. Mike, the oldest, was born there. From there, they went to a DP camp in Italy for two years. My mother told me this is where her life began. She had some family in the U.S. that was sent to this country before the war. They were able to help my mother, my father, and my brother arrange for visas so they could come here. They arrived in Pittsburgh, stayed with family for a short time. My father's first cousin, Al Stone, he arrived in Cleveland, and he called my father, and he said, Joe. I have a job for you. They were butchers by trade from home. So they picked up. And that's how they ended up in Cleveland and have been here ever since. I could tell you stories for weeks about my mother. It's a family, her children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And two, God willing, will be here soon. Words what mattered to her. The home was always open. The door wasn't unlocked. You could walk in at noon, 5 o'clock, come sit down and eat. Another chair, another chair, another chair to the table. Always room. Always room. My mother was very fortunate to have us three children, 11 grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. When I think of my mother, her strength, everything she endured, there was really never anything to complain about. My mother gave me a gift of family. She gave me my two brothers, their children, and their future grandchildren. It's a gift that I've been so lucky all my life to have. When I went to overnight camp when I was 10, she wrote me letters. Marion, are you eating? Are you washing your hands? Are you keeping clean? Are you OK? Exactly her writing was in the words, the way she spoke. When I went to Israel, when I was 16, she wrote me letters, the same thing. Here's what I'm cooking. Are you OK? Are you eating? So 50 years later, I still have all the handwritten letters she wrote to me that I will always treasure. I'm so honored to be her daughter. I will continue to tell her story for the rest of my life to my children, to my grandchildren. And I know that they will carry her legacy on. I see her strength in my two children. My father, the patriarch of the family. My mother, the matriarch. From nothing. As Rabbi Blau said, they came here with nothing, and they built a brand new community. And that community keeps growing with her strength and her teachings. The Pirkei Avot in Hebrew translates into ethics of the father. And I, in chapter 3, first paragraph, 
there's three things that I feel encompass my mother. The first, know from where you came. The second, know where you are going. The third, and before whom you are destined to give a judgment and accounting. Know where you came from. She told us all the time where she was born, how strong her family was, their values, not to forget it. Know where you are going. A time in her life, she didn't know where she was going. But the third is before whom you are destined to give judgment and accounting. She never lost her faith. Never. I think those three things always stick with me when I think of my mother. She never lost her faith. God willing, God willing, God willing. God hears me. God gives me the strength. It's going to be difficult. It was difficult when I lost my father. But he's with me every day. And the same with my mother. This last week, when she became ill, we thought it was a slight case of pneumonia. But when Steve called me the next day, I was here. I was always here as often as possible. As soon as my kids were born, I brought them here. They learned all about their grandparents. They got to spend so much time with them. They got to spend time growing up with my brother's children, both brother's children, attending each other's birthdays, bar mitzvahs, bat mitzvahs, Every occasion, every summer that we could spend together, I brought them here so they could learn what a family is, what the meaning of family and strength and value is. I'd like to thank the rabbis who have been so supportive of my mother throughout the years. I met Rabbi Blau the first time planning my father's funeral. But that meeting has led to seven, eight years of a deep, deep friendship. There was just such a connection there, the way he listened to me and to Steve and to our family. And I, I so appreciate him visiting her every Thursday. I know I would time my calling. I knew exactly where she would be each time. And so if I happened to call a few minutes early or late and Rabbi Blau was there, I would say, go ahead, go ahead, I'll call you back, not to take away the time. Rabbi Gans, you were a good friend to her. You visited her. She always told me when you brought your children how beautiful they were and just lit her up her whole life. It was not an easy transition going to Myers. Green Lawn was her home. And she often said, take me home, take me home. And again, I know what that meant. It meant going back to Greenlawn where her family was and back to her family, her mother, her father, her brothers. We tried to reassure her, Ma, you live in apartment 204. That's where home is. That's where home is. But we knew better. I hope I can have 10% of the strength that my mother, 100% of her strength, 10%. She was the very best. I could hardly wait to come see her all the time. She wouldn't be sitting inside waiting for us. She'd be outside, front door. When we'd go visit her in Florida, she'd be almost down the street. Where are they? Where are they? As soon as we'd get there, she couldn't wait to hug us. You all know my mother. You kind of grew up with my mother, being Steve's friends, being here for so many years. And I so appreciate you all coming today. She will be sorely missed but very much loved.
Jewish tradition holds, nothing happens by chance. Everything is sanctioned by God. It's no coincidence that Rabbi Blau is here today. He's been with my mom every Thursday at this time. You truly embody the meaning of the word. First, I'd like to thank my mom's clergy team. Again, Rabbi Blau, Rabbi Gans, your father-in-law, Rabbi Heitman, Rabbi Greenberg for our family's spiritual support, Rabbi Cotton and Rabbi Kirsch, the Menorah Park Campus spiritual support team, Rabbi Rosie Hyam, especially for her emotional support. She sat with my mother, held her hand the entire service at my father's funeral. She converted a family member, acted as a matchmaker, <laughs> My daughter Melanie. In my matchmaking book, you're batting a thousand. And by the way, Elliot is still single. <laughs> Rabbi Bialo, responsible for overseeing the cashew for all the delicious food my parents and our family has eaten at Myers over the years. Mrs. Alevsky, a special woman in our community. My mom turned 97 this past September which is quite a lifetime. However, her life seems to me like several different lifetimes based on all her experiences. As my sister said, she was born in Czechoslovakia in 1922, soon after encountering the worst persecution solely because of her religion. And starting her life anew after the war, when she, went my, she met my father in 1945, married in 1946, and in 1947, my brother Mike was born and starting another life when they moved to Italy in 1948, and then another as they moved to America in 1950. After enduring such horrible persecution, each of these events made her feel life was starting anew. There are a thousand incredible stories I could tell you about my parents' life. There's probably a thousand more I don't know about. Today I'll tell you two stories. One old and one new. A couple years ago, Rabbi Blau called me. He said, Steve, a woman called me. She said she knows a woman in Israel that is looking for your mom because she knows her from back in Europe. He says, I don't know any of these people. Here's the number if you want to call. Of course, I had to call. The woman says she's a retired librarian from Virginia. She's made a hobby of helping people track down lost, long friends, relatives, etc. She says she found a woman on the internet that says she's looking for my mother. Her name is Hagit. She lives in Israel with her mother, Valerie, and she'd like to speak with my mom. Knowing my mom is not on the internet, I was wondering how she tracked her down. The librarian tells me that Hagit said my mother is a Holocaust survivor. The librarian tracks my mom down in Cleveland through public records, finds out that many survivors belong to Green Road Synagogue. So she calls the office, hence the rabbi calls me. So I call Hagit in Israel. Hagit tells me some intimate details about my mom, so I know this wasn't a hoax. Hagi tells me her mother, Valerie, has told her stories. Hagi tells me my mother, her mother, Valerie, has told her stories since she was a little girl about a woman that saved her life. And she hasn't seen her since soon after that. Valerie was in Auschwitz in the same barrack as my mother arriving a few months after my mother. One day during a lineup, <laughs> one day during a lineup, the Nazis said all musicians step forward. Valerie thought this is the day they murder all the musicians, so she didn't move. 
My mother pushed her to step forward. She didn't step forward. Again, the Nazis told the musicians to step forward. Again, she did not move. And my mother pushed her again, nodding it was okay. My mother was a bit more familiar with the routines than Valerie, having been there longer. Valerie trusted her and stepped forward. Being a musician and performing for the guards earned her some preferential treatment by getting to live a bit longer than the others. The rest of Valerie's family did not make it out of the camp alive. Valerie attributed her making it out alive because on that day my mother pushed her forward. Unfortunately, by the time Valerie and my mom connected a couple of years ago, my mom's memory had faded a bit and she didn't remember her. Valerie even sent my mom a long letter trying to jar her memory, but it didn't help. Thanks, Rabbi. We tried a few more phone conversations, but nothing. Last April, I received a text from Hagid that her mother Valerie had passed. Now, I have a new friend. Now I have a new friend in Israel named Hagid. We text each other holiday greetings, invite each other to visit each other. A story that happened 75 years ago. And I just find out about it two years ago. On a somewhat brighter note, my mom has badgered every female born in this family since birth. When are you getting married? Why aren't you married yet? By the time my daughter Melanie was nine, she felt like an old maid. <laughs> when my mom fell ill a week and a half ago, all the grandchildren came to town to see her. Last week, my mom hardly opened her eyes or spoke. When I said Alex was coming in with his wife, Jill, she smiled when I said the word wife. It was incredible. When Melanie arrived and was speaking to my mom, who hadn't opened her eyes, spoke, or smiled all day. Melanie reminded my mom, saying, Bobby, I'm getting married. And she held up her ring, saying, here is my ring. My mom's one eye popped open for a moment, looked right at the ring. She flashed a quick smile. We all looked at each other and laughed, knowing my mom understood completely. Although I never personally witnessed it first thing in the morning, I'm sure my mom said, Thanking God, she opened her eyes for another day. Because she thanked God at least 20 times a day. Something you think would be difficult for a survivor to do. But that's who she was, a survivor. She never made herself a victim. 30 years ago, my parents bought a condominium in Miami. No one could believe they actually did it because they never treated themselves to anything. Their entire focus, their entire lives was on the family. Their children and grandchildren have spent practically every winter break since then vacationing there, with my parents being there up until about the last 10 years when they could no longer make the trip. It was then that we all realized they did not buy it for themselves, but for all of us so the family could have a place to be together. On a personal level, about 10 years ago when the financial crisis hit, my entire business came to a halt. And it lasted for years. It didn't take long for me to realize there was not just a silver, silver lining to it, but it was a real blessing because it gave me the time to have lunch with my parents each and every day. Although I can't say it was divine intervention, intervention for the world, it was for me personally. I want to thank my mother's team for taking such great care of her past six years.
Jocelyn Brenda Carmen, Lydia, Zoe Zara Shurit and Olga. You not only added years to her life, you added life to her years. I want to thank all of you who are here today and listen while we speak about our mother. We're truly fortunate and blessed to have this community around us. My mother's range of compassion, faith in life, and for life was vast. She lived with a mindset and an attitude of four perspectives. As he said, it's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get up. John Keats, a poet, he coined the term negative capability. He said, I believe that Abraham taught us that faith is not certainty. It is the courage to live with uncertainty. He went on to say that Abraham had negative capability. He knew the promises God said would come true. He could live with the uncertainty of not knowing how or when. Third, from the Talmud, those who are righteous, who fill their days in productive and positive ways, are considered alive, even when they are dead, while those who bring toxicity and negativity into this world are viewed as dead, even when they are alive. And the last, from the late Lubavitch Rabbi, There is compassion that feeds the ego, and there is compassion that humbles it. Compassion that feeds the ego is a sense of pity for those who stand beneath you. Compassion that humbles is born of a deeper understanding of the order of things. When you understand that your fellow, when you understand that your fellow man is lacking in order that you may be privileged to help him then you are truly humbled. Thanks. usually write things down I, I speak from the heart but over the last week when I was thinking about my grandmother there were so many thoughts stories things that I knew if I didn't write it down I, I would be up here um, all day uh, speaking so thank you to everyone uh, for coming uh, for those of you that knew her which I imagine everyone here did for the most part um, my grandmother was a very special woman to us, she was simply known as Bubby. She was our Bubby. As a Holocaust survivor, she had strength beyond comprehension. While I spent so much time with her over my life, you know, she never really talked to me or we never talked about those days, but she would always say to me or show me, you know, her tattoo that she had on her arm and say, you know what this is just so I knew even from a very young age where she came from what she went through and I would always say yes she was kind and generous and I'm going to echo a lot of things my aunt and uncle already said but she cared so deeply about all of us her family that was her mission and purpose I was fortunate to grow up right around the corner from her. She lived on Greenlawn. I grew up on Halcyon. And I got to visit my grandparents almost every day. While my grandfather, who passed away four and a half years ago, was a man of few words, Bubby was the perfect compliment to him as she had no filter. Um, not, you know, not in a bad way, but anything that crossed her mind, um, 
she spoke, it came out of her mouth. That, that's how she was. She could talk to you for hours, asking no, not only about yourself, she would ask every question under the sun, how's school, what are you doing, everything. And then she would go on to other members of the family. What's your father doing? Did you talk to him? How's your mother? How's your brother? What's he doing? Does he work? Is he at school? She went through everyone. Every time I saw her, it didn't matter. It was a battery of questions, but that's just how she was because she cared. She cared so much about all of us. I remember one time I visited her in Florida. This was maybe 13 or 14 years ago, and we were having lunch um, where she lived. There was a restaurant, and it was just the two of us. There was no one else in there, and the waiter came over, he takes the order, and he had kind of an accent, so the way Bubby was, where are you from? He had to, she had to get his life story, and I think they spoke while we were eating lunch. I mean, he stood there. Thankfully, there was no one else in the restaurant. For about an hour and a half, getting his whole life story, sharing hers, where they grew up, similar places, speaking in different languages. And I remember at that time, I asked her, I said, how many languages do you speak? And she never would talk about herself. You know, she didn't brag. It was just uh, about five languages. I'm like, this is unbelievable. Who speaks five languages? But she did. I remember another time a friend of mine uh, came to visit me in Cleveland. This is probably about 20 years ago. And again, same story. What's your name? Where are you from? Where's your family from? And he was also from a European background. And I, I remember it vividly. She was like, oh, you're a Mudyar? Three hours. They sat there and talked in front of the house on Halcyon, Dad. She sat there in a chair with my friend Alex, who lives in Florida. Three hours they talked. I mean, I think I left, <laughs> but it did. But it didn't matter. She could talk to anyone for any length of time, and she was just easy to talk to. You never got frustrated with the questions. Well, sometimes. Um, one thing we always joke about uh, with some of us in our family, um, you know, if she would be in a store, it could be a grocery store. She would just call out, uh, hey, lady, how, how much is this? You know, There was no waiting in line. There was no excuse me. And we could say it to each other now. It's, uh, it's you know, a tribute to her. But if I say to my wife or my brothers, you know, hey, lady, we, everyone knows what we're talking about. It's just how she was. Not in a bad way, but it's how she spoke to people. She was our bubby. When she moved to Myers, I don't remember exactly how many years, seven, eight, nine years ago, um, we would go see her all the time. And the door was always open, whether she was resting, taking a nap, it didn't matter. She would get up or you would wait for her. And even in her 90s, there'd be the same questions. How are you? How's your wife? How are the kids? Did you talk to your father today? How's your mother? What are your brothers doing? Nothing changed from 30 years ago to today. It's the same questions. We would go there Friday nights for dinner. My kids were six and almost eight grew up going there Friday nights so many times. Every holiday, whether it was Pesach, Rosh Hashanah, we went to be with her. We didn't have to, we wanted to, and we knew her family was so important to her that to see them, to see us, it lit her up even when her health was failing. One thing you, you mentioned, Steve, about you know asking uh, about Melanie, when she getting married. I, my son, Oliver, I think when he was five, she started asking me, when, when uh, is his bar mitzvah? Are you, are you planning? Where is it going to be? What shul? I would have to say Bubby. He's only five years old. We, we have plenty of time. But she looked forward to those milestones, and it was important, even in her last years. She was so happy and proud 
to see my children. My daughter, who is six, she was born on September 19th, the same birthday as Bobby. They share a birthday. And I remember when she was born and when she heard the biggest smile you could ever see on her face. And every year, we would always say, okay, it's both of your birthdays. And my daughter, who's six, she knows that she shares a birthday with her. And she asked me the other day, who am I going to share a birthday with now? She loved all of us more than we can ever imagine. So when she was in the hospital last week, I know I got a text from Steve, I think it was on Monday night, that you know she was in the hospital. You know, we think it's a bit of pneumonia. And, you know, at 97, she's been in the hospital, you know, several times. Um, you know, at first year, certainly concerned, but we knew she had bounced back so many times. But after a couple days, we knew this time was different. Um, I was at the hospital every day, sometimes twice a day. I would go, after I put my kids to bed, I would say to my wife, I'm going back to Hillcrest to be there. And when I would come home, she would ask, how is she? The same. And she would ask, who is there? And every day for a week, I said the same people, my parents, aunts, uncles, brother, sister. She came here from Los Angeles. My cousins, they came from California, New York, Chicago. We were all there because we cared for her, not because we needed to be there. No one told us we had to be there. But we wanted to spend time with her because we cared for her so much, it still didn't compare to the amount that she compared or she cared for all of us. We will all miss her. We will all remember her as the kind, loving, generous person she was to all of us. Just finish by saying, We love you, Bubby, and we will miss you. Something that's always been difficult for me to, to understand about funerals <coughs> is the, the posting in the obituary that, that says celebrating the life of, of so-and-so. Celebrating just sometimes seem like maybe not the, the appropriate word to be using. You know, when your, your friend or family member loses their 60-year-old mother to cancer, you know, it's tough to use the word celebrate to really describe the occasion. So they had so much living left to do and so much more to see. I, I view, you know, it's a tragedy. As I think about Bubby and, and celebrating her life, you know, I truly see this as the most fully lived life that is 100% celebrating here today. She had a huge loving family who were all with her till the very end. And for 97 years, she lived a healthy life. You know, right now, who, who signs up for 97? I'd sign that dotted line right now. <laughs> when I think about what Bubby meant, not just to me personally, but to all of the grandkids, is that she just so naturally did everything the right way. She raised my dad, Marion, and Mike, just to know that you know, family is everything. It came so effortlessly, and it was instilled amongst all of us, all the grandkids. You know, her self-anxiety when they, <laughs> they got the apartment in Florida, it was just so we could all spend the holidays there with them and just have that time just with them and ourselves. Otherwise, you know, we wouldn't see them all winter, and, and because of this, we have our absolute favorite memories with them. There was always enough food around, whether she knew anyone was coming over or not. And there we always were around the table. <laughs> Bobby taught us exactly how to speak our minds, although sometimes could have used a little filter. <laughs> she, she was the first to sell her grandsons. We weren't eating enough. And granddaughters, they were eating too much. <laughs> but it, it's in these moments that you teach us generationally how much we all really mean to each other. <laughs> 
the really crazy thing is about her life is that she was able to naturally just teach us all of this, having gone through what she did in the war. And, and it's something she never really talked about unless you asked her to, and, and she was glad to then. But I don't think it was anything to do with comfort with Bubby. I think she was just so proud of the miracle of the life she put together. And that was in the past to her, otherwise. But you know, our family having gone to Auschwitz to visit the other year, and, and just seeing the conditions you li she lived in for a year, you, know, you really have to see to know. And it just provides a ton of perspective to so my family and ourselves. It's, you know, we all, we all cry when they run out of hot water in the showers at, at Lifetime or the gym. And, you know, but we went a whole year without shoes or a jacket. And cold and winters are, you know, they're similar to, to Cleveland. We all know how cold it is. But, you know, it makes you think the things to complain about in the world, you know, it just provides perspective there. I think every day we just continue to see her miracle just extend past our furthest beliefs. You know, I got a call actually like late last night from um, my friend Brock Hirsch, and he says, you know what, Elliot, I always tell people every day that you know if your Bubby hadn't made it, I wouldn't be here today because if Bubby wasn't here, my dad wouldn't be here, if my parents weren't here, his parents wouldn't have met, and then he wouldn't have been there. And you know, like it's just an example, like Bubby's reach. You know, how far does that extend? Who's it impacted? It, it's you know, past her wildest dreams now. Um, my cousin Julie Viroff, who she was with us all week as well, she wrote, she wrote a few words that I wanted to share as well. Um, she had to go back to San Francisco for her uh, ultrasound for the baby to be soon. Um, but this is from Julie. Um, I wish I could be there in person to celebrate and remember Bubby together with all of you. There's so much to say, but I'd like to focus on two gifts that Bubby gave me and that I think reveals something about the person she was. In the days before she passed, our family spent what might be to an outsider seem like an unusual amount of time talking about the food Bubby used to make. Stuffed cabbage, veal stew, spaghetti with sweet meat sauce, noodles and cabbage, jello and fruit. The memories of her food are indelible in part because it was all truly delicious, but more so because of what it represented. Her deep love for her family and her commitment to bonding us together as a community. When Bubby cooked, she made enough so that anyone in the family who happened to stop by unannounced could eat. Her food didn't just sustain our bodies, it gave us an excuse to be together. We'll probably never be able to eat her signature meals just right, make them right just right, but the relationships built around her kitchen table are the real legacy. She gave me the gift of a loving, extended family that shows up for one another, and for that, I'm so grateful. Bubby is also one of the primary sources of my sense of purpose in the world. Growing up, she would show me the numbers tattooed on her arm and ask that I tell others about what happened to her and her family in the Holocaust. In making that ask, she taught me that knowing is different from caring, and that caring is different from acting. I have framed in my house words from Micah and Pirkei Avot, do justly now, love mercy now, walk humbly now. You are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to abandon it. When I look at those words, I think of Bubby. She wanted us to celebrate the opportunities, freedom, and safety that we've been able to enjoy in our lives while also remembering that those same joys were stolen from her and her family and continue to be stolen from others around the world today. In asking me to grapple with those truths, she pushed me to think about my role in repairing the world's injustices. I'm grateful to her for doing so, and I hope that through my choices in life and career, I can honor her ask and her memory. We love you, Bubby. As is noted by Steve, there are many rabbis who felt very, very close to her. I'd like to call Rabbi Moshe Gans to lead us in the memorial prayer of Kermale. We'll ask everyone to please rise. El moled achamim, shoychein meroimim, 
המתי מנוחו נכוינו על כנפי השכינו במעלוי סגדוי שמותו הרים כזוהר רוקי המזירים אס נשמס חי בס רב צבי הש שהלכו לילומו בעבור שנות וצדקו בדסקו רס נשמוסו בגן עדן תה מנוחסו לא חן מלא רחמים יסתירהו בסיף וכנופוף ליהו אלוהמים ויצרו אל מצרו אל החיים אס נשמוסו אדוי נוי ונחל עושו ושונאו אחר משכבו בשולוים ונוי מר אמין At this point we've concluded this part of the service. The interment will take place at Zion Memorial Park immediately following. Uh, the family will be observing Shiva initially following services in the interment at 26000, 2600 Village Lane in the village today until 9 p.m. And then from that point onward uh, the, at the home of Michael and Gates Mall at their residence, 2278 Halcyon. Uh, each morning, 9 to, eight, 9 to 11, 1 to 3, and then 7 to 10, with Minyanam for Shachrit at 7 a.m., and Mincha and Marv at 4.45 p.m. Friends who want to contribute can do so to the Survivors Initiative at the Jewish Community, Jewish, Cleveland Jewish Community Federation, or to WAC Min Chabad. Again, thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.